Welcome back to Deep Learning. We want to continue our analysis of regularization methods, and today I want to talk about classical techniques. So that stuff that's really stood the test of time. So here is a typical example of a loss curve over the iterations on the training set. What I want to show you here on the right hand side is the loss curve on the test set. You see that although the training loss goes down, the test loss goes up. So at some point, the training dataset is overfitted and it doesn't produce a model that is representative of the data anymore. By the way, always keep in mind that the test set must never be used for training. If you trained on your test set, then you will always get very good results, but it's likely to be a complete overestimate of the performance. So there is this typical situation that somebody runs into my office and says, yes, I have 99% recognition rate. So the first thing that somebody in pattern recognition or machine learning does when he reads 99% recognition rate is ask, did you train on your test data? And this is the very first thing that you should make sure that has not happened. When you did some stupid mistake and there's some data set pointer that was not pointing into the right data set, then suddenly your recognition rate jumps up. So be careful if you have very good results. Always scrutinize that they are really appropriate and they are really general. So if you want to produce curves like the ones that I'm showing to you here, you may want to use a validation set that you take off the training data set. You never use the test set in training. And if you would do that, you would just get a complete overestimate of performance and a complete overfit. So if you use a validation set, then we can already use the first trick. If you use it, we observe at what point we have the minimum error in the validation set. If we're at this point, we can use it as a stopping criterion and use that model for our test evaluation. So it's a common technique to use the parameters with the minimum validation results. Another very useful technique is data augmentation. So the idea here is to artificially enlarge the dataset. There are transformations on the label which should be invariant to the class. So let's say you have the image of a cat and you rotate it by 90 degrees, it still shows a cat. Obviously those augmentation techniques have to be done carefully. So in the right hand example, you can see that a rotation by 180 degrees is probably not a good way of augmenting numbers because it may switch the label. So there are very common transformations here, random spatial transforms or elastic transforms. Then there are pixel transformations like changing the resolution, changing the noise or changing pixel distributions like color, brightness and so on. So there are typical augmentation techniques in image processing. Well, what else? we can regularize the loss functions. Here we can see that this is essentially the so-called maximum a posteriori estimation. We can do this in a Bayesian approach where we want to consider the uncertain weights W. They follow a prior distribution P of W. If you have some data set X with some associated labels Y, we can see that the joint probability P of W X Y is the probability of P W given Y and X times the probability of Y and X. We can reformulate that into the probability P of Y given X and W times the probability of P of X and W. From these equalities, we can derive the Bayes theorem that the conditional probability P of W given YX can be expressed as the probability P of Y given XW times the probability P of X and W divided by the probability of P of Y and X.
So we can rearrange this a bit further and here you can see then that the probability p of x and the probability p of y given x pop up. By removing the terms that are independent of w, this yields a map estimate. So we can actually seek to minimize the joint probability as maximization of the conditional probability p of y given x and w times the probability p of w. So typically we solve this as a maximum likelihood estimator following the left hand side problem times the prior on w, which is the right hand side part. We can say that this is a maximum likelihood estimator, but we augment it with some additional prior information. Here the prior information is that we have some knowledge about the distribution of w, for example, w could be sparse. We can also use some other source of knowledge where we know something about w. In image processing, what is used very often is, for example, that natural images are sparse with respect to the gradients, so there are all kinds of sparsities that can be employed by such a prior. Now, the interesting part is that this map estimate can be reformulated. If you attended pattern recognition, you know what I'm talking about. We've seen that the maximization of the maximum likelihood estimates results in a minimization of the negative log likelihood. The typical loss functions that we are talking about have this form. Now, if you start with the map estimate, you essentially end up with a very similar estimate, but the shape of this loss function has slightly changed. So we get a new loss function L tilde. It's like the L2 loss or the cross entropy loss plus some lambda and some constraint on the weights W. So here we enforce a minimum L2 norm. Now with a positive lambda, we can identify this by the way as the Lagrangian function of minimizing the loss function subject to constraint L2 norm of W being smaller than alpha with some unknown data dependent alpha. So this is exactly the same formulation. We can now bring this into the back propagation of the augmented loss. How is this typically implemented? You follow the loss of the gradient. So this is the right hand part of the loss that we already computed with the learning rate eta. And in addition, you apply this kind of shrinkage to w. So the shrinkage step here can be used in order to implement the additional L2 regularization. So the nice thing is now that we can simply compute the backpropagation as we used to do it. Then in addition, we use the shrinkage in the weight update. So we also get very simple weight updates and they allow us to involve those regularizers. If we choose different regularizers, the shrinkage functions change. If we would optimize the training loss now for lambda, we would usually receive lambda equals to zero. Because every time we introduce regularization, we are doing something that is not optimal with respect to the training loss. Of course, we introduced it because we want to reduce overfitting. So this is something that we cannot observe directly in our training data, but we want to get better properties on an unseen test set. This will even increase the loss value of our training data. So be careful about that. Again, we increase the bias for reduced variance. Here we have a visualization of the effect of the L2 regularizer. The unregularized loss would of course result in the center of the ellipsis in red. But now you do the additional regularization, which enforces your W to be small. This means that the farther you are away from the origin, the higher your L2 loss will be. So the L2 loss pulls you away from the data optimal loss with respect to your training data set. Hopefully it describes some prior knowledge that we haven't seen in this way in the training data set. Hence, it will then result in a model that is simply better suited for the unseen test data set. We can also use other norms, for example, the L1 norm. So here we then again end up in the Lagrangian formulation where we have the original loss function subject to the L1 norm being smaller 
than some value alpha with an unknown data dependent alpha. Here we simply get a different shrinkage operation, which now involves the use of the sine function. So this is again an implication of the subgradient. Here, a different way of shrinkage has to be employed in order to make this optimization feasible. Again, we used exactly the same gradient for the loss function as we used previously. So only the shrinkage is replaced. Now we can also visualize this in our small graph. The shape of the L1 norm is of course different. With L2 we had the circle and with the L1 norm we get a diamond looking shape. Now you can see that the minima that are selected are likely to be located on the coordinate axis. So if you try to find the minimum position of this L1 norm and the unregularized loss, you will see that the point of minimum regularization loss intersected with the L1 loss is essentially on the y-axis in this plot. This is a solution that is very sparse, meaning that we only have entries for y in our weight vector and the entries for x are close to zero or equal to zero in this case. So if you want weights to be sparse, or if you want to create networks with few connections, you may want to introduce this as an additional regularization on the weights. This will cause sparse weights. What else? There are also more known constraints. For example, we can set a limit on the norm of the weights. Here we enforce them to be below a certain maximum. We want to have the magnitude of W to be below alpha where alpha is a positive constant. If you do so, we essentially have to project onto the unit ball with every parameter update and this is again a kind of shrinkage that essentially prohibits exploding gradients. Be careful, it may also simply hide them such that you don't see them anymore. There are many other variants of changing the loss. You can have a constraint and an individual lambda for every layer. So you could constrain every layer differently, but we haven't seen any gains reported in literature. Instead of the weights, also the activations can be constrained. This then leads to different variants, for example, in sparse autoencoders. We will talk about this, how they were not regularizing the weights, but the activations to form a specific distribution to produce sparse activations. This is also a very interesting problem and we will talk about this a bit more when we talk about outer encoders and unsupervised learning. So next time in deep learning, we want to continue to talk about regularization methods. We will look into the very typical ones that are particularly made for deep learning. So very interesting approaches that are slightly different from what you've seen in this lecture. So thank you very much for listening and I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye bye.